Hi everyone and welcome to Side Dance Podcast Season 3. I'm your host Jasmine Cook. This is a dance science podcast presenting discussions with global industry leaders aiming to make research and information more accessible and enhance dancer well-being, health and training at all levels of the sector. New episodes every Monday 6am London time. Thank you so much to The Place for sponsoring today's episode. Located in the heart of London, The Place is a creative powerhouse for dance development that is leading the way in dance training, creation and performance. One of Europe's most exciting, innovative dance spaces, where artists from all over the world come to push creative boundaries, to experiment and to perform outstanding new work. The Place is home to London Contemporary Dance School, a 288-seat theatre, an extensive range of classes, courses, and participatory opportunities for adults and young people, and professional development programmes for artists. Check them out at at the Place London on Instagram, and they'll also be linked in the show notes. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Side Dance Podcast. Um, I'm recording this, I'll just say it now, I just said to Megan, it's some fireworks night here in the UK, so hopefully it's not too loud, but if you do hear anything going on outside, that's all it is. Um, but anyway, I'm so excited to be here today with Megan, who is in her sixth year as an athletic trainer for Ohio State Sports Medicine and her eighth year as a certified athletic trainer. She primarily provides services to the Ohio State University Reserve Officer Training Corps and Ballet Met Columbus. Megan has extensive experience in working with performing arts patients, so I'm so excited to have her on today. Prior to Ohio State Sports Medicine, Megan was the lead athletic trainer for dance and music at the Clinic for Science and Health in Artistic Performance at Ohio University, where she completed her Masters of Science in Athletic Training degree. So I'll leave it there and I'll let Megan continue to introduce herself. Have you got anything to add to that, Megan? Um, yes. So first of all, thank you, Jazzy, for having me on the podcast. Um, in addition to the background that Jazzy just gave, um, I'm also an active member of the National Athletic Trainers Association and International Association of Dance Medicine and Science. Um, I currently serve as the Education Committee Chair for the Performing Arts Athletic Trainers Society. Um, in addition to all of this, I am also in my third year of doctoral work, pursuing a terminal degree, um, a doctorate of education in higher education and student affairs. Um, with my ultimate goal being to combine, combine my clinical experience and my terminal degree to teach athletic training or related coursework. And then just to give your listeners a bit of background on athletic training, because I know that's more common in the US where I'm based. Um, athletic trainers are healthcare professionals. We primarily work under the direction or collaboration with a physician. We're educated in primary care, injury and illness prevention, wellness promotion and education, emergency care, examination and clinical diagnosis, therapeutic intervention and rehabilitation of injuries and other medical conditions. Traditionally, athletic trainers work with primarily athletes, so traditional sports, um, but the field is continuing to grow and is now encompassing um, many more settings, including industrial settings, physician clinics, um, the military, and of course, performing arts. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, so you're obviously very, very busy. So what experiences sort of growing up influenced your decision to go into, I'm going to call it the dance science field, but it's so much more than that from what you just said there. But yeah, growing up, what sort of experiences inspired you to go into this? Yeah, so um, I think many who go into healthcare, especially in performing arts, have an experience where maybe they were injured um, as a young child, and that's no different for me. I danced from the age that I was two and was lucky enough to continue that all the way through high school, and um, I also pursued a dance minor when I was in college. Um, so when I was in high school, so I was about 16 at the time, um, I suffered an injury. It was Achilles tendonitis, um, and it took me out of dancing for about two to three months, which at the time felt like the longest experience in the world. Um, so during that time, I saw a podiatrist and was in physical therapy, and I felt both of those healthcare providers maybe didn't understand the full demands of what the level that I needed to come back to in returning to dance. Um, and maybe didn't consider me a real athlete because I didn't quite understand the demands of dance. Um, around that same time, I was taking a human anatomy and physiology course. Um, 
and starting to look into colleges, which for those of you who are based in the UK, I will use college and university interchangeably. When I say that, um, I am talking about my bachelor's work, um, which for us typically happens around the years of 18 to 22. They're typically four years of degrees, um, just to give a little more context. Um, so around this whole time was occurring, that's when I found athletic training and realized that athletic trainers worked with dancers, not just traditional sports. Um, so yeah, I kind of fell in love with it. So that's kind of been my pathway to get there. When I was in college, um, I worked on my bachelor's degree at The Ohio State University. Like I mentioned, I also minored in dance during that time. One of my clinical rotations in my athletic training program was actually with Ballymet Columbus. Um, so I was lucky enough to have that first exposure when I was a student. And then after I completed my master's work, I got to come back. That's so cool. Oh my goodness. That's such an amazing opportunity. So can you tell us a bit more, what was your master's in? So it was looking at hypermobility and pirouettes and you presented it at I Adams 2017, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, so can you just tell me a bit about the process of doing your master's and also the results? And I guess did it match as well with your expectations of what you thought you would find? Yeah. So um, first, again, just to give a little more context, my master's degree is also in athletic training, um, which is kind of uncommon, I guess. Athletic trainers will typically pursue a master's degree, but usually it's in a different area because we are certified when we graduate with our bachelor's. Now, this is probably a little nitty gritty, but the whole field is um, shifting to a professional um, entry level master's now, not relevant, but my master bachelor's and master's degree are in the same thing. Um, so during that time at Ohio University, I was also a graduate assistant athletic trainer and I worked in the shape clinic, like Jazzy mentioned earlier, um, with their dance music and theater majors and their marching band. Um, so my patient population reflected clearly my research interests. So my research project um, was the effects of hypermobility on a dynamic balance task in pirouette and use in university dancers. I had about 20 dancers who completed um, my research project and they ended up splitting quite nicely into two groups, a hypermobile group and a non-hypermobile group. I used Baton score to determine who was hypermobile and who was not hypermobile. Jazzy, do you think a uh, explanation of Baton's score would be useful? I think most people will know, but maybe just give a quick outline. We have got an episode, I think it's episode two, season one, which talks a lot more about hypermobility, but yeah, maybe just a quick outline. Yeah, so um, if, if they score a, a four or higher, um, then they're considered to be hypermobile. So the test includes passive hyperextension of the fifth MCP joint past 90 degrees. I, I don't pass all of these, but I'll try to demo. Um, passive bilateral wrist flexion with the thumb to the ventral forearm. So this one's a little weird. So you touch your thumb to the front part of your forearm. Yep. And both of those are bilateral. So we're up to four already with just the finger and the thumb to the forearm. Um, and then the next one is bilateral hyperextension of the elbow. So you want to see if your elbow extends past 10 degrees. Um, oh, and then after we look at the elbow, we look at the, for the same thing at the knees past 10 degrees. Um, and then the final one is forward flexion of the trunk with the knees extended. And you're looking to see if participants can put their palms flat on the floor. This one is interesting because there's a lot of controversy controversy around this in dance literature, whether this is an acquired skill or a natural skill, because we know that dancers touch their toes frequently in their training as they're stretching um, or, you know, pursuing other dance techniques. So that was interesting when I was going through my research and doing a literature review to like kind of dig into that a little bit more. There are some um, studies that have proposed a modified version of that, where instead of putting the palms flat on the floor, they're asked to put their forearms flat on the floor. That only changed the hypermobility score for my participants with, I believe, one person. Um, so I kept the original for the purpose of my project. So after I looked at their hypermobility, the next thing I did was assess their balance. Um, I chose to use a modified star, star excursion balance test so 
I'll explain this one too, because it can be a little tricky um, to conceptualize. So with a modified star excursion balance test, there is an eight point star drawn on the floor. And I used athletic tape to draw it on the floor. And um, basically like you're thinking about two X's that crisscross over each other. Um, the participant stands in the middle and then we do the test under three different conditions. Um, a flat surface with cognitive interference. So me asking them questions as they're supposed to move around the star. Um, and then on an unstable surface. So I used a foam balance pad for that one. Um, so then the position for this, their hands are on their hips. They're standing on one leg. I also asked them what their preferred turning leg is. Um, and that was the leg we tested because I was gonna ask them to do a pirouette later. So they stood on that leg and then they have to tap each point of the star with their leg. Um, and it's an eight point star. So all the way around themselves. Um, and then they cross in front to get to the, that opposite corner under those three different conditions. And I'm looking for errors. So if they fall off of the center, if they step down, their hands come up off of their hips um, and counting those errors as they go through the test. So, and all of those errors, we did three trials of each, all of those errors will were totaled for their complete score. And then finally, I asked them to complete a pirouette. Um, for this one, we used some motion capture um, equipment, which was basically two sensors. One was attached to their sacrum um, with like a little uh, elastic belt, and the other one was attached to the top of their foot. I chose these two spots because I was looking for center of mass and center of pressure, and I also calculated leg length with this too to kind of give me a better idea um, to normalize like what that would look like between participants who are different heights. Um, so with the pirouette, first they were calculated like what their center of pressure and center of mass looked like. I believe I called it like their vertical angle, um, just standing in releve with their opposite leg at passe. So I wanted to see kind of like where basically their center of mass was over their center of pressure while just standing in that position. And then we looked at that angle and how that angle changed as they completed a pirouette. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so they were given two practice attempts and then the next two attempts were recorded. And then I calculated the average maximum vertical angle displacement of each trial. So, I then did a statistical analysis, which it's been a while. <laughs> so I'm not gonna give you the details of that. <laughs> um, but basically the results that I found were what I predicted to find. Those in the hypermobile group had more errors on the balance test and they had a greater vertical angle displacement compared to the non-hypermobile group. So as they're turning, their center of mass comes farther away from their center of pressure. Um, and they had, uh, on those three trials, they had more errors, they fell off more, they stepped down more, their hands came off their hips. So they, it was harder to get um, their balance to stay where they wanted it to stay. Um, and if you look into the literature, it, it alludes to that because with hypermobile individuals, their proprioceptive and nerve ends within their joints um, may not be working as hard or actually they're probably working harder, but they may not have like those same sensory inputs or outputs that non-hypermobile individuals will have. So those all happen within the joint capsule and then there's, it causes your muscles to work over time. Um, so basically a lot, a lot of things that can result from, a, from being a hypermobile dancer, how it can impact your balance, potentially your dance technique. Um, our recommendations with this was to institute to maybe some balance and strength training programs for those dancers who are hypermobile. Um, because we know that if, if they do have um, impaired balance um, and potentially impaired technique, they're more likely to injure themselves. So that's our ultimate goal to prevent injury. Um, so yeah, I think that's a maybe a too in-depth overview of that project, no, but that not. was what we found. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Megan. It's just interesting to see because you've 
come such a long way since then you're doing like so many amazing things so it's really interesting to see that that's where you started because I think a lot of people who listen are in that place in their lives at the moment and beginning their research so it's really interesting to hear about it thank you so much and you presented at I Adams right yes um it was about a year after I completed it I think is when I presented it at I Adams yeah, that's amazing. Sure. So looking now at your work at Ballet Met, um, I was going to ask for a day in the life, but when we spoke, so we spoke, was it last week, I think, and I we wondered if a week in the life might be better because your days are so varied. So could you just tell us a little bit about what you do at Ballet Met um, and yeah, perhaps a bit of a week in your life? Yeah. Um, so I'll give you an overview of my entire day since it starts rather early. Um, so like Jazzy mentioned, I work with Ohio State's ROTC program. Um, so that means I'm up at 6 a.m. with those students where I primarily provide injury checks for them. Um, so these are students who are training to be officers in some sort of the military in the US. Um, and then after that, I, when I go to Ballet Met, I do honestly similar things to what I do at ROTC with just a little bit more in depth at Ballet Met. Um, I'm looking, I'm doing injury checks constantly. Um, we do daily treatments. And in addition to that, like potentially some rehabilitation of injuries that we may see, first aid, anything that you can think of from like a healthcare standpoint, I'm probably doing in a, in a week's time. Um, as we get into, so we're getting close to Nutcracker. Um, as we get into Nutcracker, we will go to the theater with the company um, when they have performances. So on those days, I will be at the theater at Access, which is usually um, on matinee shows when the, when the um, show is in the morning, usually about a half hour before their class time. In the evening shows, it's about an hour and a half before the show starts. Um, and then during that time, it's mostly treatments. Um, it's been interesting to kind of transition back to what I would consider a more normal environment in the continued air of COVID. Um, I'm finally starting to feel like things that happened and treatments and like my typical routine is starting to normalize more compared to our um, half of a season at the beginning of 2021. That's great. Yeah, thank you, Megan. So just as a quick side note, um, you mentioned you work with military recruits, and it's quite similar. You're not the first person who said that. I think it was Sarah Needenbeck um, who said in another series, she said that she also does the same, and it's surprisingly similar. So what sort of similarities are there here? Um, yeah, it's actually been super interesting to see because my prior, prior to coming to Ohio State, I had no experience in that population. I clearly primarily worked with performing artists. Um, and the movements that they do are different, obviously, like my ballet dancers are dancing, my ROTC students are mostly running, but it's so, it's so, for both of them, it's so much overuse. Um, so I see like a lot of stress reactions, stress fractures in both populations, a lot of tendonitis and tendinopathies. Um, so it's just really interesting to see, even though they're doing such different movements, their injuries overlap a lot. Um, and it's funny too, because we just talked about hypermobility. Most of my dancers are hypermobile or have increased flexibility, especially compared to the ROTC students. So I have to, for me, I have to tailor kind of what my expectations of them are when I give them a home exercise program. Um, my ROTC students may have never foam rolled in their life, whereas my dancers probably foam roll multiple times a day. Um, but yeah, it's super interesting to see that really high instance of overuse injuries in both populations. Yeah, do you think that has anything to do with their mindset as well? So perhaps both a ge generic statement, but quite competitive sort of populations? Yeah. And um, I think the mindset to like to resist injury as much as possible, where I, I will say I see this a lot more in my ROTC students than I do in my dancers. I hope that now um, we've created a culture at Ballet Met where when they first feel something, they come to come to me immediately. Um, where the ROTC students are maybe a little hesitant to admit that like something feels weird. Um, but they, I did think they both definitely have a mindset of like push through. Um, so I, I think it's 
that, the like kind of pushing through injury, pushing through pain, and in addition to like that competitive nature, whereas we're seeing dancers compete for roles, yes. Um, we're seeing RTC students, um, they have to meet physical fitness standards. So I think it's more like competing against themselves in that mindset of, oh, I have to meet these standards because I have to pass this test. And dancers may be a little bit more competitive with each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think you started to touch on this a minute ago and then we kind of went a little bit off it, but just to come back to it. So you mentioned, I remember actually when we spoke last time, you said at the moment with COVID, it's almost a state of survival, like just trying to get through each day, um, which is possibly true for a lot of people in many, many senses. Um, but in the sense of your work, it's sort of injury prevention to get through each day instead of, you said it's not what you'd really like to be doing in terms of making a true impact. Could you tell us a little bit about this? So I guess in terms of performances coming back from COVID. Yeah, so I noticed this a lot more. Um, so Valley Met, we are 2021 season, 2021, 2022 season just started on October 18th. So before that, after when COVID first happened, we were shut down in March of 2020. Um, and we didn't come back to the studio until January 2021. So the dancers were laid off for essentially nine months. Um, so when we did come back in January of 2021, we were split into two pods. So it's a small company, maybe 30, including our second company members. So basically 14 or 15 dancers in each pod. Um, and we did an abbreviated season where we worked on the same four pieces for basically six months. They choreographed two, four pieces. Um, and they rehearsed them up into the point where we started performances in our small black box theater um, that because of COVID restrictions, they only sold tickets to, I think, 30 or 34 people. Um, so very small, intimate performances. And when we per performed, we performed at least two shows a day up to, I think, four shows a weekend because we, pods alternated performance days. Um, but they were doing those same four pieces from January to June. And when we got to the time of performances, each pod had 40 shows in a two month span. Um, so for sure during that time period, because there's only 14 of them, the whole six months felt like survival. The dancers felt it. I know I felt it. I know the artistic staff felt it. The dancers especially felt they couldn't be injured, they couldn't be hurt because there was no one to step into their role for them because there were only 14 in each pod. And in addition to that, they were sub podded. So really in each piece, there were max six dancers. Um, so during that time, and I would say even still now, my work includes a lot of manual therapy, which for this population is super necessary because they do have a lot of overuse injuries. They are doing the same movements in rehearsal over and over again, especially leading up to Nutcracker and especially during the first half of the year um, where we were doing the same four pieces over and over again. But I felt like I was just putting band-aids on everything and not really correcting maybe the biomechanical problems of why this pain or this potential injury, this, um, like muscular discomfort was existing in the first place. Um, so when I say a state of survival, that's definitely what I think we all felt. It was, we had to get through each day. We had to um, manage things rather than fix them. Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting. So my next question, which I don't isn't technically on our list but I'll give you a minute to think if you want um so as opposed to this what would your aim be like if you had your ideal world not in COVID times what do you aim to achieve with the dancers instead yeah um so these are actually I've been thinking about this a lot lately too um especially as we gear up towards Nutcracker in the past um I've created preventative exercise programs for the dancers based on the movements that they're completing. So typically I do one for each show. Um, and this year I've been thinking about maybe breaking it down into like particular um, roles in Nutcracker um, because they are so different. Um, whether our dancers are doing Clara or Sugar Plum or some of the um, diverts like Spanish or Arabian, 
the, the demands of their bodies are so different for each one. Um, but really, so in these programs, I'm looking at their movement. Now I've seen Nutcracker a lot of times, so <laughs> I kind of know what to expect when we do um, maybe a newer ballet, if our art artistic director is creating a new work or um, we're doing like a George Ballantine piece um, or something to that effect where we have somebody else come into the studio, I will ask to observe rehearsal so I can see kind of what they're doing um, a lot of. And so I can kind of predict what, what injuries I expect to see. Um, so Nutcracker, for example, we're doing more point work. We barely did any point work last year. So I'm seeing a lot of foot and ankle things right now. Um, but really like creating some exercises to um, counter the repetitive movements that they're doing in rehearsal. So I think another big thing that I start with for probably all programs is core work. And when I say core work, I don't mean like sit-ups and crunches and planks. I mean like let's activate the deep core muscles that basically encompass all of your organs that hold you together because those are the really important ones that, you know, activate your core rather than just like the six pack muscles that are more aesthetically pleasing. Um, so yeah, so I try to include like really basic core exercises and honestly really basic like starter exercises in all of these programs that I create, even when I'm individually giving a dancer a program, because I think that, especially at this level, they've been doing this a while, they know how to achieve the movement that they need to achieve and sometimes they're not doing it in the, in the best biomechanical way. Um, so I like to break things down with them um, and really kind of focus on what is the correct activation pattern when you bot ma your leg to the back. Your glutes should fire first, your hamstring should engage, and then your back should contract last. And I see, I think this is super common in all athletes, but especially dancers, because they're, they've learned to compensate and to, you know, get their leg maybe 10 degrees higher um, because they're using muscles, not that they shouldn't be, but they're using a lot of force. Um, and then when we start to develop back pain in that particular movement, I'm like, what's going on with your glutes? I don't think they're working. Your back's doing all of the work here. Your hamstrings have taken over. Your glutes aren't doing anything in this current moment. Um, so I think not only observing their movement that they're doing frequently, but then breaking it down and bringing it back to the basics. Um, so we can really focus on what your body should be doing and in what order and how can we support this at the very basic level and then make it more challenging for you. So you can bring those basics into the high level performance that you need to. Yeah, definitely. Um I'm not obviously an athletic trainer and I've never worked with a ballet company like that, but that sounds like really a really positive environment and really supported by the company and sort of the system that you're in. It sounds like it really supports that for you and for the dancers. And it sounds quite, from what I've heard from other people in similar positions to you, sounds like quite a forward thinking company. Am I right in thinking that? We try to be. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so more generally then, does this, what you're doing at the moment, I'm going to suggest probably the answer is no. Um, but from what you've just said there, your goals as an athletic trainer, I imagine a state of survival probably isn't your goal as an athletic trainer. Um, but what balance in your work, not just in dancers, but perhaps with your military recruits as well, do you hope to have in giving them the power to, um, I was going to say the power to prevent their own injuries. That's probably not the correct way to say it, but you know what I'm what I'm getting at there. The power to honestly, I agree with that. I think prevention is my my biggest goal for for all of them. Um, a couple of years ago, I noticed when I first started working with ROTC that everybody had shin splints. Everyone had shin splints, and they always waited until it was too long to come see me, and they had turned into stress fractures. So. In an, in an attempt to complete this, now there's so many of them. And because we have all three branches at Ohio State and, and their staff um, is assigned to work here and there's they're like three year turnover, it was really hard and still is hard um, to implement something like widely across the 200 to 250 students. But I created a, similar to what I was just talking about, a shin splint prevention home exercise program that I sent out to the staff members to disperse to students 
in the weeks leading up to school starting, knowing that they would start come back to school and start running more. Um, so I would say in an ideal world, like if I could customize a exercise program for each dancer, that would be ideal. Um, in the past, the Ohio State Performing Arts Medicine team, um, which I'm a part of, it consists of orthopedic physicians, um, physical therapists, athletic trainers. Um, we include nutrition and sports psychologists in there as well. We've created um, a screening tool, which is pretty widely, there's lots of dance screening tools out there. Um, I'm sure people will have seen lots of um, research at iAdams about particular screening techniques that they may use on their dancers. Um, so we've done this in the past for the company, for um, summer intensive students too, where we take them through range of motion, strength, balance testing, like more particular and specific things that are applicable to dance that we have pulled um, maybe these tests or um, strength range of motion testing techniques from the literature. Um, so in an ideal world, I would love to have every dancer go through that screen or even just have a general conversation with me at the beginning of the year about what their goals are, what maybe they're, they feel they're struggling with, and then be able to create a personalized exercise program for them to work on before they're injured. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, there's obviously challenges to that in terms of like the environment that they're in, um, resources, especially I think in dance. Uh, so what do you see to be the long-term fix for this, maybe realistically? I think probably for me, um, and I feel like we're, we're getting back to that a little bit now because we're not potted anymore. Um, dancers were working on Nutcracker, which is very familiar to them. And they know kind of what the demands will be as we get closer to opening. Um, I think it's really important in any scenario to have a strong relationship with if you're a healthcare provider, your patients, if you're a teacher, your students to kind of know um, that shared knowledge of like what their demands will be and have them know that they can come to you with issues. Um, I think in the, a realistic approach would be as those relationships continue to be built and become stronger, um, encouraging dancers to come see me before things are a problem. Um, when they're first noticing like, hey, I did 60 arabesques today, my back is hurting, like something's going on. Can we work on something to maybe counteract what I'm doing in rehearsal? Um, so I think that, not prevention, early implementation maybe is what I'm trying to look for, um, where we can really try to dig into those things before an actual injury happens. Yeah, definitely. I love that. Again, we mentioned earlier the culture of manual therapy not being the be all and end all. And um, I'll say it again, it's not my expertise. Right. I'm not an athletic trainer or anything. But what do you have to say about educating dancers on this? Because dancers, I think, from experience, often want to be fixed here and now and don't really have the, often don't want to have the mindset perhaps of a longer term fix, just like things to be solved straight away. So, educating dancers perhaps on how, yeah, yeah. manual yeah. therapy isn't the be all and end all. Yeah, I think that this is something um, like from a personal standpoint that I've noticed a lot, especially as we get back into the season. We were off from June to October, so my hands and forearms are out of shape too. <laughs> um, so after our first week back, like my forearm was swollen. I could tell like it had been a while since I had done that, that much manual therapy. Um, but I think they really go hand in hand with what we just talked about, about prevention um, and like exercise programs. Um, and I, I definitely think that manual therapy has a strong place in overall dance medicine um, because dancers are doing repetitive activities so frequently and are prone to overuse injuries. So, and in my scenario at Ballymet, they dance for six hours a day. Um, 
So in order to get them through all six hours of rehearsal, they may need a little extra care in the middle of the day. Um, but I think really emphasizing that manual therapy is a tool, not the solution. Um, now I will say like, in addition to that, I know most healthcare providers who work in dance medicine are very highly trained in multiple manual therapy techniques. I myself am trained in dry needling, instrument, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization, which is, um, Graston is the really common one. Um, it's basically like metal instruments that you're using to mobilize tissue instead of just using your hands. Um, obviously like deep tissue massage and some other myofascial release techniques. I think really the emphasis needs to be that these are a part of the plan, not the entire plan. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I think you've put that really nicely. I think it probably has really interesting implications for dancers in the future, being able to utilize these skills, but also have their own injury prevention programs with early implementation, like you were saying. Um, the last thing I would love to talk to you about today would be you were talking about how you're, it's kind of a switch from clinician to educator, which is a work in progress at the moment um, with your, like your studies at the moment. So why is this something that you'd like to do and where do you hope to take this in the future? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually approaching um, the final stages of my terminal degree, which for a doctorate of education student, so an EDD, um, is for us, it's called a dissertation in practice. So as I am approaching this stage, um, I'm really starting to think about how I want to incorporate um, this degree and my experience as a clinician into my future and kind of what I want, how I want those two to come together. Um, and it really brings me back to the reason I chose to pursue another degree in the first place. Um, education, not only of patients, but of students has been a strong like force, I would say throughout my career so far without really me even noticing it. Um, when I was working on my master's degree at Ohio University. I had undergraduate athletic training students that I served as a preceptor for. Um, I had the opportunity there to, to serve as a teaching assistant for an anatomy course, um, a couple athletic training specific courses. I get guest lectured a few um, like dance kin kinesiology course for dance majors at Ohio University too. And really like, engaging in all of those settings, it was such a high for me. Um, and it was so exciting to help students really connect the thought, their, connect their thoughts between um, maybe the material and either with the dancers, like how they could connect those concepts back to their movement practice. Um, and with students, how we can like take what we were talking about in the classroom with anatomy in particular and apply it to patients. Um, so really, like the connection point between my clinical work so far um, and moving towards a more education mindset. It's always existed. I feel like I can finally see further into the future where I can actually make this a reality. Um, but I think for both, like no matter who we're talking about, because I would love the opportunity to like teach, teach a dance kinesiology course to university dancers. I think that would be so important for them. They're so in touch with their body as is for them to have the background knowledge of like, hey, what does this muscle actually do? And then me be able to tell them, oh, well, when you bump onto the back, your glute needs to fire first for them to understand that full process of that. Um, I think would just be so beneficial for those students. And then as we apply it to athletic training students for them to be able to take the clinical skills that we're talking about. And honestly, that same thing to then be able to tell a patient, oh, well, when you do this movement, this is what's happening in your body. Um, I think it kind of just comes full circle. Yeah, definitely. I absolutely agree. And I think that message comes through in a lot of what you've said today already. So that's great. Um, that's all for me today. Thank you so much for your time, Megan. It was so great to chat. I'll just say, if Jeff, if you're listening, thank you so much for connecting us both because you, yeah, you've just been a dream, Megan. You're so, so lovely. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to mention or discuss today or a take home message perhaps? Um, as we were continuing to talk, I did 
forget to mention one other thing when we're talking about manual therapy, and this kind of goes back to education too. Um, I kind of mentioned foam rolling earlier. I think kind of empowering dancers to know how to foam roll, know how to like do that self-release work in addition to the, that exercise program will give them those additional tools, right? That way they're not super reliant on the healthcare providers that they work with. They can manage those things on their own. Um, I wanted to mention that because I think that's important. Um, I would say too, like for me personally, we talked about my master's research. Another reason why I chose a doctorate of education program and not a doctorate of philosophy was because research, me researching is, it's not one of my passions, education and teaching is. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that I don't use research. I would say I'm more of a, a consumer of research than I am an actual researcher. Um, so I think like as students um, who are maybe at this point in their life where there's kind of, kind of thinking about how they want to move forward, being able to kind of take that knowledge, especially like what I, what I learned in graduate school, completing that study made me really appreciate um, research studies that I use now and incorporate into my work. So even though it may seem overwhelming to complete your own research study, those skills are going to be transferable. Um, and even though I say I don't consider myself a researcher, again, as I'm approaching my dissertation in practice, it's gonna become a reality again. Um, but I really think like the overall process of learning how to do research then makes it that much easier to consume it and then take that research and apply it to whatever practice you may be in. Yeah, definitely. I think that's really helpful advice. Thank you, Megan. It's been so, so great to chat. Um, I think that's all for us today. Thank you so much, Jazzy. See you later. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. Tune in again next Monday. And in the meantime, follow at Side Dance Podcast on Instagram. It would also be so appreciated if you have a moment, if you could please rate and review on Apple to help the podcast grow. Bye.